I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. One decision I hope you'll make is to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen or watch. I'd also appreciate it if you'd subscribe to our free daily newsletters at clark.com slash newsletters. We make it really easy to unsubscribe if I bore you to tears, but I got a lot of stuff that I think can help you with your wallet. In this episode, I begin with my absolute favorite thing we ever do, Clark Stinks. And later, I want to talk about something that actually happened to you, Krista, <laughs> bad bugs. Why? There are reports that you have to pay extra attention as you travel this summer so you don't get those ugly bed bug bites and maybe bring them back to your own house later. Yuck. So without further ado, it is time for me to stink it up. I have never encouraged you to speak. You must think I'm pretty stupid. You should be ashamed of yourself. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right, pal. Okay, you told a person who was going to grad school that if her state had a tax benefit for contributions to a 529 to put money in and then wait until the second year to use it. Most states only require you to leave the money in the account for a week or two before you can withdraw it. So a better strategy to take advantage of the state tax benefit, especially in states like South Carolina, which is where that uh, question, the question came from, where there's no limit to the state tax deduction, is to put the money in, let it sit uninvested for the minimum required days, and then use it to pay for the qualified education expenses. No need to wait until the second year and no risk of loss, Anita. Anita, thank you. So my reason for waiting is if you don't have enough money to pay for both years of grad school, let's say, because most grad programs are two years, some are three, is that you want an additional time period of tax-free earnings on the money. And that's why if you're having to pick and choose and there's not enough money in a 529 to pay for everything, I like for the money to be in an account longer so it has time for growth. I don't remember the context of the original question. Was I specifically talking about making sure you left it in a waiting period to qualify I believe so. I don't, yeah, that sounds right to me. Okay. Well, she was if in I South did Carolina. say that and that's not required in the state you're in, then uh, I stand corrected. Since you don't like Mr. Howard, I will refer to you as Senor Howard. You don't stink, but something was foul. A teacher that's married to a carpenter called asking about not being able to find houses in their price range, and they were considering a new build. One option that I did not hear might be worth looking into is Good Neighbor Next Door program from HUD. It might be slim pickings to find a house, but a teacher, law enforcement officer, firefighter, or EMT might be able to buy a qualified house for 50% off the list price as long as the buyer commits to living in the property for three years. Thank you for all the great tips. Go Cowboys, John. Go Falcons, John. <laughs> Thank you for this tip. I'm not familiar with this. Mm -mm. Uh, I'm not familiar. It's called the Good Neighbor Next Door Program from HUD. Teacher, law enforcement officer, firefighter, EMT. Uh, that is great information. And uh, can we check to make Absolutely. sure that yep. is a real deal? And Write it up on Clark.com. Clark yeah. You made the point of why I take very little vacation. Companies lack loyalty to employees. My company legally has to pay for any vacation time when eliminating a position. I keep mine just under a max of 10 weeks or just enough to avoid donating time. In addition to the above reason of not taking vacation, there's also facing a backlog of a couple hundred emails after one day of being out of office. Richard. Gosh, Richard, it sounds like you work at a miserable place. Seriously. I hate that for you. I hate the idea of feeling like the company treats everybody like dirt. You've got to hold on to that so you can get that money at time that they would can you. That going on vacation is filled with dread because you come back to a mountain of emails. 
I, I hate it when someone is a place of work that you feel like you do. And I hope that the time comes if these people actually do give you the heave ho callously that you will land at a place that actually you enjoy working at and that you enjoy who you're working for. Gosh, we all get so excited for each other when we're taking vacation and everybody wants to see pictures and that just sounds awful. I'm so sorry, Richard. Clark and Krista, you both stink on this one. I'm wow. a longtime listener and neither of you ever mention how great it is for the environment that Costco and Aldi do not provide single-use plastic bags. Shoppers need to have their own bags, reusable hopefully. Start giving those companies props for improvements to the environment. There is no planet B. And that's from SB. Have you never heard of Elon Musk? He's going to take us all to Mars someday. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, the, the reusable bags are great and I travel a lot and I go to place after place where you're not allowed to uh, just get a disposable bag anymore. And it's not that hard. I have, um, I have a bag that, you know, I wear cargo shorts. I know that makes me like out of date or whatever. But I have this, this bag that is a reusable bag that I just keep in my pocket. And when I go somewhere, I've got it. And I can use it, and then I'm not contributing to the waste of those bags. And I know you don't want to hear this, but Whole Foods, which I do shop at for certain items, they give you 10 cents back for every bag that you bring. So I always make sure I have my bags in my car because I save money. Really? Mm -hmm. They also do, at Whole Paycheck, they do paper bags, Mm -hmm. which are biodegradable. Is that the right term? I guess, and recyclable. Okay, I love listening to you, and I do every day, but Clark, you need to stay in your own lane when it comes to life insurance. I was an agent for many years before retiring. There are a couple of reasons to have life insurance on children. One, if something was to happen, how would that family pay for the cost of burial? Don't say you would recommend a GoFundMe. That is for people mostly who haven't planned ahead. And two, if you lose a child, it's going to be the most drastic, unthinkable thing that will ever happen to your family. How many people are going to want to go back to work three days later after their benefit of time off from work is over? One can use funds to cash flow several days or even weeks for the family to regroup during this terrific, this terrible time that just hit them. Almost every adult life insurance plan allows for a child's rider to be added for very little cost. You have to be talking to everyone, as many do not have the means to care for that expense outside of life insurance, Mark. Mark, thank you. And as a parent, I know there would be no greater tragedy in my life than losing a child. And it's just a fact. And money cannot replace that. Um, The compromise with what I say and what you say is what you said at the very end of what your post, uh, heartfelt post said, and that is adding a child as a rider to an existing policy is a very, very affordable way to get done what you're talking about and avoid the crazy expense of a child life insurance policy. And I still say, what I always say is that you don't buy insurance on as much as we love our kids, they're, they cost money. They don't generate income. The purpose of life insurance, the principal purpose of it is replacement of income. I very much appreciate you taking the time to share that post. I waited 24 hours to write this as I was so incensed after your irresponsible attack on the We Buy Investor guys. You opine about something of which you obviously have a child's understanding. I've been one of those guys for over 20 years, completing over a thousand transactions, so I think I qualify as an authority. For starters, a property is worth what a buyer is willing to pay and a seller is willing to accept, not some fancy form produced by a realtor or an appraiser or what you happen to think, and equity is a relative thing. You're by no stretch of the imagination a market expert just because you've owned some investment properties yourself over the years and think you know more than you do. The guys I know provide a valuable service to a property owner who needs to sell that a realtor has nothing, neither the expertise, ambition, or patience to provide. I'll use a recent transaction of my own as an example. A property came to my attention that was boarded up by our city that was headed to tax foreclosure sale. 
The owner was deceased, which presented some title issues, and it had been vacant for several years. No one knew how to locate the heirs or cure the title, as well as other problems, until I came along. And I can tell you, others had tried over the years. I did. I bought the, and resold the property as is to a rehabber for an as-it-sits value. Yes, I made a profit in the process, but the point is that I put money in the heirs' pockets. As it was, they would have gotten nothing. At closing, they thanked me for coming into their lives and told me I had been a blessing. Um, and he goes on and on. So listen, Clark, stay in your lane. Stick to the things you know something about, like how to pinch pennies on groceries and cease and desist with your ill-informed advice in areas in which you don't, Rod. Rod, thank you. And uh, for those of you who did not hear that podcast segment, I was talking about an investigative report that found that there were some people in the in the distress purchase business of homes that were actually taking advantage of elderly individuals who had diminished mental capacity and getting them to sign a sale of their home and having allegedly lied to them saying they would still be able to live in their homes moving forward and things like that. And it was an ugly, ugly investigative report. I did not say that uh, everybody who goes out there and buys distressed real estate is trying to cheat people. What I have said, and what I still say to this moment, is that it is a much better idea to fix up your home, if at all possible, instead of selling your home as a wounded duck. Because the money you will get for your home is much less than the cost it would be to dress up and fix up your home when you put it on the market. And I did not mean for you to take offense as a real estate investor or other fellow real estate investors who buy homes that are in difficult situations, often because of people problem situations like an estate sale. I think that Clark misses the opportunity regularly to shift his market view and help others see market opportunities in down times. Example, oh, Clark, I just got a bunch of money and the market is down. What should I do? Ask the worried investor. Clark will reply, oh, you should park the money somewhere, whatever, wherever, it doesn't really matter, until you feel good about the market again. With that answer, the investor will miss the upswing. A paradigm shift is seriously needed here. The answer should be to invest at ASAP. The market is on sale right now. When the market is down, that's the best time to invest. And yes, it may go down a bit more, but that's okay with the time value of money and dollar cost averaging. The best of both worlds. And by the way, we all know how Clark drools like a dog looking at a juicy steak on the table over a sale. Chanel. Chanel, I wonder if you heard somebody else because what you said is what I say. I don't, I don't know. Do you have any frame of reference? The only thing I can think of is the questions where they need the money to be liquid because they're going to need to use it in the next several years to buy a home or something like that. So investing is a long-term play. I have no idea what context, Chanel. So if you want to write back and say what context it was you felt like I was saying this, because I always tell people that investing is a long-term game and that dollar cost averaging is a great tool to overcome fear of the current marketplace. That's simply where you put in uh, roughly equal sums of money on a regular basis, whether it's monthly or quarterly or whatever, and that long term there are far more up years than down years you don't let the doldrums of the market intimidate you from being in it because when the market turns often people wait too long till it feels safe and they miss the big gains which usually happen early in a recovering market before I explain why you stink, I must tell you that whenever a financial question arises in casual conversation with friends that I can't answer, I often reply that I will defer comment until I consult with my husband, Clark. Since I'm a happily married lesbian, this always elicits a good chuckle. <laughs> Rest assured that I do tell them about your show and that the marriage is fictitious. Here is why you do stink. At your recommendation, I replaced my perfectly functional Honeywell thermostat with a Nest thermostat. Even the Costco price was hefty, and the discount I anticipated did not come to fruition because I did not meet eligibility requirements. I installed everything properly, and it seemed fine until this May when my home needed cooling. 
I set the stinking nest to 75 degrees and on the cooling only setting and left for the weekend. I returned to a 105 degree home. After reassuring myself that the settings were correct, I concluded there was not a problem that there was a problem with the HVAC system and I suspected, suspected the thermostat was malfunctioning. Thankfully, the heating cooling tech came promptly and diagnosed the problem. He described Nest as, the, as thermostat designed by an internet company that know nothing about HVAC systems. He explained that Nest thermostats are not reliable in homes that have heat pumps. I was often disappointed to hear that he attempted to appraise Nest of the problem to no avail. Please advise your listeners accordingly. Fortunately, I do have use for the Nest in a home that only has a furnace and no heat pump. Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen, thank you. Um, I've never heard somebody in the HVAC business knock Nest in the way that that this contractor did. Uh, The smart thermostats are incredibly effective at reducing consumption if you let them do their thing, where they learn your patterns and they automatically adjust based on your normal patterns of when you're home, when you're not, and the rest. And I just hate it that your home went to 105 degrees, which made me wonder about something else. If maybe you don't have adequate insulation in your home, uh, particularly the attic of your home, I'd love for you to check, pull down the attic stairs, go up and see. If you can see the rafters in your home, you probably need insulation. Is for the thing with uh, Nest thermostats not working with modern heat pump systems. I wasn't aware of that. No, I'm, I do I have a heat that. pump, and I use. I we have two nests in our home. You I have a, have a thing where there's like maximum maximum temperatures that I have set up, and you mm-hmm. can check it from your phone. So I always do that. But I do have a heat one heat pump system. Oh, come to think of it, we have a heat pump. We have two heat pumps, and we're Nest. And we haven't had that problem. I'm I'm really puzzled and could confused. have been a defective device, maybe that Mary I, Ellen got. I don't know. Okay, we'll read one more. Somebody in HVAC will let us know, yes. right? Clark, you stink worse than the sewage treatment plant in my town on a hot day. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> you stink at math. A caller asked about buying a new minivan after their old car died. They said it was an '85 Civic. You said in reply, "Wow, a 28-year-old car." Wrong. This is a 38-year-old car still driving my 97 Avalon, a 26-year-old car. The Clark Smart Way, Mark. (laughs) Okay. I mess up on math. I was such a good math student. It's so funny that on the fly, I will mess up on math routinely. And that is completely true that I flake out and get the number of years wrong and all the rest. So an 85 Civic, Civic, 15, 23, 38 years. Yep. And I said 28. Mm-hmm. Okay. That was lame of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So something that I have proved lame of over the years is Krista is obsessed about bed bugs. You, you've talked about them all through the years. And I've always kind of rolled my eyes about it. Turns out... You're right. I'm wrong. We're going to talk about it straight ahead. So, Krista, USA Today has been all over this bed bug thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because it's always been the newspaper for travelers. And they're talking about the bed bug problem in hotels, uh, in Airbnbs, VRBOs, and that this is a real, real, real. Serious problem that is worse this year than normal. And the best guess in industry is because of the cutback of housekeeping staff in hotels in particular, where hotels are still saying they're way short and they try to ask you not to have uh, housekeeping services. A lot of times hotels will now say you don't get housekeeping services except every third night or whatever. But whatever the cause, it apparently is really, really ugly this year. And the USA Today thing has video after video showing uh, people with 
uh, all the bites on them, and that's what you had, right? Yeah, I had, I woke up with, in a hotel with a lot of, they're like pairs of bites and blood from bed bugs that have bitten me overnight. It was really gross. Yeah, and the bed bugs can then travel with you. Yeah, I, I was actually staying at this hotel for like a couple weeks in, in this case, and I, so I, I moved rooms, but before I moved my stuff, I took it to a laundromat. I washed everything I had. I cleaned my suitcase thoroughly, and then I moved into the new room. So uh, the thing about the bed bugs is prevention's the best cure. And the problem that's come up, here we go with Airbnb versus hotels again. If you do a proper inspection in a hotel and there are bed bugs in that room, you can change rooms. What do you do in an Airbnb? Because you're there mm. and there's not like another hotel room you can move to on the other side of a hotel. Uh, but anyway, how do you properly check that bed when you get to the hotel? Number one that I read, because once I read the USA Today story, I read a bunch of other posts from people in articles about this. So the greatest threat in a hotel room is a fabric headboard. <coughs> <coughs> fabric headboards are where the uh, bed bugs can let's live. Let's start again. The greatest threat. The greatest threat that you face in a hotel room is if there's a fabric headboard which is why you don't see a lot of fabric headboards anymore in hotels. Uh, one of the things in, the, in one of the articles I read was talking about how the bed bugs will hide behind the buttons of a fabric headboard. And you're supposed to look closely at those buttons to see if there are any bed bugs living there. They love those headboards. But let's go to the mattress. Uh, and I don't want to, to make mattresses. people... You're going to fight the mattress. Go to the mattresses. I don't want... I hate creating paranoia. I'm trying to create caution on your part. So you pull back the bed cover, the sheets, the blanket, all that, and you look in each corner of the mattress. That's where they're likely to be hiding on the side corner of the mattress, each of the four. And if you see any, you head on back down to that desk and you ain't staying in that room. But the interesting thing, the suggestion was, you don't stay in the room on either side of that one or right above or right below. So if you're in like room 519, you don't want to be in 419 or 619. And you don't want to be either room, either side of room 519, is an example. Mm. And the bed bug thing, once it happens, you talked about washing your clothes. You wash them in extreme hot, hot water. Yeah. I always tell people wash clothes in cold water. Remember we had all the people oh, yeah. in Clark Sinks unhappy with me about that. <laughs> but anyway, you wash in extremely hot water. Or if you have older ratty clothes like I do, you could just start over <laughs> a new wardrobe. And so. what's the thing about closing the curtains? Did you mention that? You close the curtains in the room and use your flashlight from your phone? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Most important thing I didn't say. Boy, I'm flaky sometimes. So the inspection you do with the bed. You make the room as dark as you can. You use the light on your cell phone, you know, the flashlight on your cell phone to look in the corners. You're much more likely to see them if the room is pitch black dark. And in each of those four corners, you're using your flashlight and on a fabric headboard, you're using it as you inspect each of the buttons of the fabric headboard. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just don't what want anyone I do to get bitten. do without you, Krista? I'd just be... <laughs> I'd be so ineffective. Still be the Clark Howard show. All right. Tony in Pennsylvania says, Clark is adamant about just taking a carry-on bag when flying. Is there an amount of days, especially traveling to a colder climate, 
when a check bag would be necessary for Clark. Thanks for all the good and most of the bad. The stinks have been so creative lately. Thank you very much for that. And Joni, there is no length of trip that I do not do a carry-on suitcase, period. And uh, if it requires me to do laundry when I'm on a trip, I do that. I will not, I will not check a bag. And I've just, and, and I should say where that came from. When I was in the travel agency business, over and over and over and over again, we'd get calls from clients whose bags had gone missing. And it was such a hassle for people that that's why it became embedded solidly in my brain that I do not check a bag. Dan in Washington says I oh, have... Oh, I didn't answer the cold weather thing. Oh, yeah. Cold weather. So there are jackets sold now uh, by lots of sellers online where you buy these winter coats that have multiple pockets in them and nobody charges you for your coat on an airline. So you stuff stuff uh, wintertime kind of goods in the pocket. So I'll put gloves in, scarf, uh, one of those bank robber kind of hats <laughs> if I'm going to a really cold climate. What do you call those? Yeah. Ski, you know, uh, things ski that, mask. that yeah. just show your eyes and mm -hmm. your mouth. And so you can handle winter and what i do when i pack clothing for winter is i take um t-shirts for every day of the trip and then rotate three different sweaters so i have enough t-shirts for a trip unless it's really long then i have to go do laundry but i do the one carry-on bag regardless of the climate Dan in Washington says, I had a seven-day Airbnb reservation, which I reduced to six at about the fifth day. I was hoping for a partial refund, at least to let the place be available for others. I misread it as saying a $100 refund when it was actually me being charged $100 more. Of course, I should have read more closely before requesting this, but I'm feeling cheated for getting charged more for less. I spent over an hour with the Airbnb support and only to be told that its policy will, will not, they will not change their policy on this. The host first insisted that this was a fee from Airbnb and not going to them, and then later acknowledged the issue but said basically tough. Planning to leave a very negative review, contest the charge with my credit card company, and avoid Airbnb as much as possible in the future. Anything else I can do? So this is, I should tell you, hotels are doing this same thing too with an early checkout penalty where you have to pay and pay a penalty, it is the most ridiculous junk fee ever. What in the world is the problem when you are paying for a stay and you leave early and you have to pay an extra fee for having left early? Can you think of any logical reason why an Airbnb Airbnb or a hotel would think that's an acceptable thing. No, but I think you have to pay for the night you're not there. That's not what this right. is. Right, I understand that, but that's what I'm saying. I'm yeah. saying, yeah, an additional, in addition to, to paying for the extra night that you're, because you're already staying there five days and you cancel, and they, they don't have time to get a replacement tenant, then, or a hotel, or whatever, they probably don't have time to sell the room. You should, if their policy is you have to cancel two days before or whatever, you still have to pay the cost of the night you missed. But then this but additional that, fee is But then is paying crazy. an additional yeah. fee. Now, where do you see this with hotels is normally convention hotels. And they expect on top of the convention rate to make a lot of money off of you spending money in the hotel. And my guess has been over the years that they charge a fee for you not being there because they were anticipating extra revenue from food and beverage from you being at the at the convention center hotel, and now you're not there. But even if that's the, the excuse, it's not acceptable to charge you more for not sleeping somewhere than what you pay for sleeping there is just crazy. And yes, leave that bad review, leave that low rating, and maybe maybe the host of that property 
will change their mind and give you back that that junk fee or they will suffer the consequences as people look at reviews and airbnb has got to do a better job of having guardrails around their system how many times have things come up in the last many months about problems people have had with airbnb and i talked recently they did this new summit where the ceo said yeah we haven't been listening to our our landlords or whatever you call what you, the hosts mm -hmm. or the guests like we should and we're going to do better this is an area that you're listening you're on listening to her now you need to fix this and not permit a junk fee because somebody left early Robert in Washington says, have you found Google Flights to be less reliable lately? Yes. The last couple of trips, we've used Google Flights to find the lowest fares. But once we click the departing and returning flights, a message says that, unfortunately, the price has increased. Then if we do find one and go book through the airline, the fare that Google showed doesn't exist anywhere. Do you know what's going on? It's very frustrating. So I don't know, but you're right. Google Flights has not been as accurate lately, and it's still a very useful tool, and I find it's the exception rather than the rule with the inaccuracies where, and I get that message from time to time, I'll click on somebody that says, that fare is no longer available. I don't see the thing you said where you click through and the fare's just not there at all. I haven't seen that. I guess that's possible. But it is true that too often now you'll click on one on Google Flights and it will say that fare is no longer available. It is frustrating and I don't know why. And I read a huge number of industry uh, publications and I've not seen anybody write about this yet. But if I do see something where somebody has an authoritative answer, I will certainly talk about it and think through if there's other effective tools I could recommend. One of them I should recommend to you, I really like Hopper. I think Hopper is a really good booking tool. And anyone who has Capital One credit card has access to Capital One's travel, uh, Capital One Travels, Airfare Search, and their search engine is Hopper. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Remember, we're here for you around the clock at Clark.com and at ClarkDeals.com. And our Team Clark Consumer Action Center, Monday through Friday, here to serve you with one-on-one -on -one free advice, guidance, and information, six hours each weekday from 10 in the morning Eastern Time Zone till 4 in the afternoon Eastern Time Zone. You can reach a member of the Team Clark Consumer Action Center at 636-49-CLARK. Have a great day.